Hello there, you beautiful soul, and welcome back to another Culture Talk segment with your host, Rebecca Munoz of Cultured Society. I am here with yet another special guest, and this one I'd like to say that doesn't need an introduction, but to me, he is someone that is so relevant, especially in this day and age that we're living in right now, and I have had the pleasure of knowing this person for the last 18 years. And through our journey of going along our own personal journeys, we've had the opportunity to stay in touch. And it's been really great to see his evolution, to see all the amazing creations that he's putting out into this universe. I had an opportunity to catch up with him a couple of weeks ago. And it was funny because on his Instagram, I was scrolling through my Instagram and I, I uh, came across a post of him and Doja Cat. And he had the most, he has the funniest expression on his face and his caption just like threw me for a loop. I just started laughing and I, I couldn't help but just reach out to him shortly after I saw that picture because it was truly a reflection of who he is as a person. And as famous as he is now, he's still the same person that I met 18 years ago and I'm really grateful. So. With this, I introduce Evan Ingersoll, also known as Chuck English, how many of you might know him. So raised in Detroit and molded in Chicago, producer MC and co-founder of The Cool Kids, Chuck English continues to mix the melting pot of hip hop as he collaborates with a wide variety of artists across the industry. After teaming up with Sir Michael Rocks in 2007 to found the game-changing alternative hip hop duo, the Cool Kids, English went on to tour the globe over and crafted a pioneering sound that shook the foundations of hip hop and rap. Between 2007 and 2012, English produced the two studio albums and four self-released mixtapes with rocks as The Cool Kids. The duo's blend of retro rap and their fresh sense of style are reminiscent of golden age hip hop, an era celebrated for its innovation and influence. As the Cool Kids, English, and Rocks have helped to shape the current digital music landscape and continue to inspire an entire generation of young indie alternative artists. In 2013, English released two instrumental beat tapes and his debut solo mixtape, Drop Tops. In April 2014, English co-produced and released his first studio album, album Convertibles. The 13 track project featured collaborations with artists such as Cool Kid member Sir Michael Rocks, as well as, the Ch as Chance the Rapper, Chromio, Action Bronson, DJ, BJ the Chicago Kid, Ab Soul, and Mac Miller. The album received as much street cred and underground success as it did critical acclaim around the world. UK's Q magazine called the album compelling with its buttery rhymes and an ability to zero in on your rhythmic G spots. Today, <coughs> it's just. <laughs> Today, read that part. Oh man. Today, English is seen as an independent and unapologetic force in hip hop and an elder statesman for the forthcoming internet rap generation, being a leader of the new school. He continues to work with young and aspiring artists, helping them to develop their own industry flavor. In 2015, English put the final touches on his record label, Sounds Like Fun Records. He also produced new material in anticipation of his second studio album. The aptly named Everybody's Big Brother, which was released in September 2015, I wanted to name my album something that meant something. What do I represent? Who am I to the world? Where have I always been? And English explained in an interview with Fader earlier this year and through the phase of years that, have, that he's taken to redevelop and redefine who he is and realized that where he's been. Since his Cool Kids <coughs> Day, mid 2000, 2000s, English solo work has risen far above the digital landscape, crossing over into pop, funk and electronica. Meanwhile, his label Sounds Like Fun Records also continues to soar and diversify as English develops his roster further. 
As a producer, English has expanded to work with diverse artists such as Maroon 5, Big Sean, Rick Ross, Sid the Kid, Casey Veggies, Chance the Rapper, Quinn and Yasmin, among many others. English currently lives, raps, produce, DJs, and hosts jam-packed parties out of Los Angeles. His that was a while ago. <laughs> we don't got, <laughs> there's no more parties here now. <laughs> that's yeah, all that's with. <laughs> um, it's a weekly jam. Well, back in the day, consistently rocks downtown LA every Wednesday. Back in the day, and hopefully after this whole COVID thing lifts, we'll be able to start doing that. Featuring a variety of regular guests, including Jay Davey, Asher Roth, Budgie, and Orange Calderon. And English himself on the ones and twos. Most recently, English won the Global Spin Award. 2015 Regional Open Format Club DJ of the, of the Year in the Midwest. Wow. And let me tell you that this is a resume that can yeah, go and off and yeah, yeah, and that's from five years ago. That's crazy. It's been, it's been a lot. It's been a lot of different things that have changed. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I with this, I introduce again um, Chuck English, and I'm so grateful that you took the time to be here with me today because I know you have so many things going on. Um, but I think that it was, for me, it was really relevant to bring someone like you on because I have had the opportunity to live life with you in many phases of your life. And I know that as you continue to rise, you continue to be the same person. And I'm so honored for you to be my 11th guest. Okay. So, yeah, like yeah. <laughs> exactly. Do. Yeah. Um, so do you mind if I call you Evan? I don't, it's up to you. I just, um, you know, like there's no separation of like Evan and Chuck, it's just, you know, um, it's kind of a family nickname that, uh, a nickname I, I kind of created from um, all of my grandfathers being named Charles. So it's not like, it's not informal to call me Chuck. It's just, I look like my grandfather and I look like all of them. Like, uh, like this little cheap feature I got, that's like six generations of the same like face. So I just thought it was like, cool because I, I do like my right I do like my name like I never thought Evan wasn't cool it's just Chuck just sounded like a good sounds like it was cool and and no one no one ever mispronounced Chuck for some reason like I can tell somebody my name's Evan and it, they act like they never heard that name before and they'll be like Edwin Edmund shit that I haven't even heard people say is like bro how'd you, all right well I'll make it easy for you it's whatever you want to call me Oh, well, I know you as Evan, and I feel right. comfortable talking to you as Evan, so that's what we're going to use today. I like it. So I, um, I came up with a series of questions that oftentimes are not asked in interviews, and I think that it's really relevant to not only know people as artists, right, but it's also very relevant to know people for who they are as individuals, because at the end of the day, artists are creating from their inner mind. It is their own personal creations from their own experiences, their own uh, philosophies. And I, I truly believe that it's really important, especially with our age group to understand why people do the, the things that they do and why they are or how they've evolved into the persons they are today. So it's crazy because all the questions that I've asked have been the same to every person that has come on to the series, yet the conversations are so different. And so with this, Evan, I want to ask you the first question. What is your life's philosophy? <clears throat> um, eh, that's a great question because there's there's the answer and there's a way to answer it because mine is slightly like Bruce Lee's be water, be willing to adjust. Uh, I think my, my never ever thinking something is so permanent <clears throat> or believing something so true uh, gives me a freedom to be uh, more of a student. Like even if I get to Let's say I'm studying um, uh, a denomination of Christianity, right? Like, 
over time we've come to learn that certain things are misprints, certain things are uh, not the exact translation in English as it was written in Hebrew. Like there's a lot of things that, you know, you get deeper into the future and it's not exactly what you thought. And in that, a lot of people get their world turned upside down and uh, feel like they've been lied to or feel like, uh, how could this be? And it's like a form, it's not a form of, <clears throat> hold on. It's not a form of damage control, but I would say that what that part of that philosophy I was saying, which is never, never being so stuck in my way that I don't have the ability to move out of the way. You know what I mean? Cause shit comes at you fast. Um, if you have big dreams, a lot of that comes with like large expectations of them going the way you saw. And I've watched a lot of people be deflated and disappointed by shit that's inevitable, which is that wasn't your call. You know, like you can say and walk into whatever manifestation, but if you ask for a house and you walk in the house, but the walls are green, so the fuck what? You know what I mean? Like, why, why is that the issue? Well, well, I saw it this way. So now you're disappointed because, you know, it's a version of what you, this is actually what you need. You know, what you want is always up for, up for discussion. You know, it's even like people in their relationships, people with their work partnerships, you know, you have such an idea for how it's supposed to go on your side that you don't take into account that there are other humans and they're going to see shit their way too. Like you might, might agree but your disagreement is pointless and um, not being able to adjust or not being able to see other people's point of view is a real, it's like really standing in a glass box in a windstorm, like your shit's gonna get cracked. So I would say that yeah, the life philosophy is that this is a long journey and a short one, which should tell you everything at that, that we don't know what's going on here the only thing we could do is gather the information that we get and be willing to process it correctly and apply it to where it's neat, where it sees, where you see fit. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. You are so right. And hold on. Think, oh, oh, you done? Go ahead. <laughs> no, my Siri thought I was said Siri for some reason and asked me, did I want anything? No, I didn't. <laughs> so, no, uh, but yeah, that's, I would say that. Yeah, the life's philosophy is not just one sentence, but you know, I I'm happy to be here and I'll take what I'll take what I get and I'll move from there. Doesn't mean I'm gonna stop reaching for stuff, but I don't it's not gonna disappoint me. And I think a lot of people's frustration or where, where their mental health goes, if you step back and you add it up. You know, people take those lumps personally. They like, my shit didn't work out. My relationship didn't work out. Like, I'm deserving of it to work. True, you are, but that don't mean shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, maybe you're just in the wrong spot and you're too unwilling to know that, you know, just because you come here with people or you're birthed through people, I don't mean that you owe that part of yourself to them. You know, a lot of people are in, you know, family situations or, you know, like, oh, well, I can't do this because I need to be here for my mother. Then that's what it is. But it's not, and there's, there's no crimes committed for making sure that how you saw things go the way you see them. Mm -hmm. And you don't let other people that might not have anything to do or understand affect your emotions towards it. So if you're like, I want to do this. I want to do this. And your mother's like, oh, don't do that. That's no security. Go get a husband. You know, it's up to you whether you smoke that dope or not. Like a lot of people smoke their parents dope and are still stuck in, stuck, stuck in it. As much as I have a great relationship with my parents and I listen to them, but I don't give a shit what they say because this is mine. And I, put my foot in front of the other so that I could have that independence. You know, like if your parents are 
are, are bankrolling you, you can't say that to them. You got to know how the game is played. And that's where a lot of other things is where you're not adjusting. You're not adjusting to the fact that your parents now see you as a tenant and don't see you as their child. So you can't ask for that same type of respect. And uh, people get people get knocked off their rocker for that. So like I said, just the ability to just accept, see people's perspective and then just apply it to mine is my life philosophy because I believe that when you do that, you know where to place yourself and you know where not to place yourself. Like you can have some bad days on some good terms if you play this shit right, but you're never gonna not have a bad day. Mm-hmm. Like it's something's gonna get on your nerves it's just, do you think it's funny or do you take it personally? Mm-hmm. I tend to think the shit's funny because <laughs> I'm kind of ahead of my body. I know what I'm, like I have an ill balance spiritually and you know what I got to do on this earth. Like I can be as spiritual as I want to, but I still got to go get in traffic. So it ain't like I can avoid traffic or avoid the line at the grocery store or avoid the shit that might annoy me or somebody in front of me is driving like an asshole. Spirit, I don't care how spiritual I'm. I'm gonna hit the horn, and I'm about to let you know that you're driving like an idiot. <laughs> like you have to roll with that. Yes. So say, you definitely have to be real uh, uh, adaptable. Yeah, and- because a lot of spiritual people that have like spent their whole day in and day out doing the work, it's like you get up to this spot, and you're like, oh shit, I'm actually just so ascended that everything else doesn't match me and it's like bro you if you're in this spot you got to go into that restaurant bathroom just like the other unspiritual person and you can't be walking out the bathroom being like my day's ruined because all these low vibrational people are around like that's your fault like (laughs) you live here we don't live there so you have to figure out how to see both sides and be balanced and and everything, even the symbolisms of spirituality, they always show you some sort of balance. Like the yin and the yang, everything has, even even vaccines had the disease in it. That's how they get rid of it. You get what I'm saying? Like everything has to have a, a slight balance or it doesn't exist. It won't exist correctly. So, and correctly doesn't mean just your way. It means like it has to function. Absolutely. So yeah, yeah, that's my... That's my life philosophy is we're not going to make it out alive. Don't take this shit that serious. Yes. Like, if you don't like the way things are, pick up and do something different. Jesus. Now, if you feel some type of way about how people feel about you doing that, like I said, that's on you. It's not like there's no laws against that. They're, oh, well, everybody's treating me like shit because I want to change my life. That's, you know, it comes with it. Like as someone that has gone the hardest way or took the long road or I don't ever try to figure out the easy way to do shit like I don't even I can't empathize like I've done it the hard way and I've still not taken it that serious because if you do there's really no super reward at the end of it there's just a there's next season a great example of that is Football season, like the week up until the Super Bowl, there's all this big thing, you know, like a team wins the Super Bowl and instantly TV is about to do its closing coverage and then it's going to go over to the next show. And now it's like, damn, that's all there is for the Super Bowl. Yeah, bro. You just get to watch that shit, eat a couple snacks. And when it's over, the masked singer is going to come on. That's life, bro. Like it's not, (laughs) you're going to want your team can win. And it's still tomorrow. Like, I always ask, what does Cinderella and her prince do the next day? You know what I'm saying? Like, everybody talks about the Cinderella story, but, you know, she put the shoe on and they lived happy ever after where? Like, she had to go buy some more shoes tomorrow. She only had one. Then she got to go tell her sisters, like, I'm out. Like, she got to pack up her shit. Like, it doesn't just go into a paradise. Like, it's just not the way uh, it's not the way it's set up. So when you take your mind outside of this, this ever living, ever giving jackpot, like, nah, because you'll get over that sensation too. You know, yeah. everything can go right. And now you're looking for, oh, well, I need some thrill in my life. Things have been going so well. I just want to scare myself or get close to death. So I feel alive again. Like, 
everybody's gonna look for something as soon as you get what you want and it's all based off that emotion that you got from when you want it it's not gonna feel the same the second one or the third one or the fourth one it's the process in between and it's like some tom brady said he was already just ready for next season like the championship just lets him know like my process is so perfect and i love my process so if this is what i get for working this hard i'll take it but it's not the end of the world because i i'm i'm, I'm i love the process like i want to keep playing so it's not like just about the championship because that would be a, a, a crazy come down it's about <clears throat> taking yourself out of it and realizing like there's so many different uh so many different layers to the goals that you want to achieve or like how you want to see your life but just appreciating being here and knowing like I could have a good day or motherfuckers could get on my nerves, but I'm still gonna have a good day regardless. Even the bad days don't seem that bad. They just feel like necessary work days. Like, yes. so that's my process. Absolutely. And you know what? I can attest to that because I have actually seen, well, I remember when I met you in, in 2003, you were in a very different phase of your life, just like I was. And I remember even when you went through the process of leaving school without, you know, finishing out school. I know that you reached, a, you um, you met a lot of, of adversity in that phase and even people like telling you it was a bad idea to leave. And you always followed your inner guide and your intuition and what you needed to do for you in opposed to listening to what everybody else had to say about what you needed to do for you. Yeah, and I got, I got, I got voices in my head. I got to answer to like people outside my body. You don't got to deal with me knowing something, the inner conscience telling me it and me worrying more about, the soul outside my body's thoughts. Like, I don't give a shit because <clears throat> me doing what I think is right doesn't affect you. And I know a lot of people want, they want their opinions heard, but you know, I got a lot of knowledge. I've done the work. I hardly give my opinion unless asked. You know what I'm saying? It's like a sign of intelligence to me. People that listen are smarter than the people that talk. So once I noticed how to identify that, and knowing how much I saw this being this way, even at like 17, 18 years old. It's like, that's why, you know, certain things in college or going to like a university. When I was in high school, I knew to go to the school I was going to, cause I was like, that'll put me closer to what I need to do. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't give a shit about uh, going to the homecoming in college or doing all the college shit that was being marketed to us. Cause I also think that shit was propaganda. Like, you know, you're out the house, stay on campus. And you know, there's a ton of sex here and parties and all that shit. And I'm like, ah, I don't believe you. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know if that's true. So let's go about it my way. Let me go to, let me throw myself in the pot. Like, let me go to a big city and stay in an apartment building, have no one else to give me the class but myself. And let me see how I can rock in real time. And, you know, even when school came to a close, it was, I saw the world shifting and I saw that um, what I would have to do was going to be deeper than just having my paper and saying I'm graduate. And I was not wrong. Everybody that went to art school, like if you aren't like perfect at what you do, um, the jobs are just, they're there, but it's gonna be hard to get them because it's a certain thing you have to be, like I was designing DVD menu screens as a final. We don't even watch DVDs no more. Like the menu screen doesn't fucking matter. So knowing that what I was doing, I, I had a passion for doing it on the other side. So I'm thinking of video, music videos, uh, album cover concepts. And then I, I know that what I want to be is the artist that's making this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, this ain't gonna pay. This ain't gonna do for me what I thought it was gonna do. And having that little time where I, I like broke my ankle in school and had some time off and really made every single thing that the cool kids came out on 
sitting on my couch on painkillers trying to get myself back to square one. Um, that's when I knew. And the one thing I am for certain on is I know when the party's over. Like, I ain't never been there too late. I ain't never, like, been the dude trying to see, like, if there's any girls left or was at the party when it got shut down. Like, I was already, like, I felt that. So, <laughs> oh, uh, uh, the, the police broke up the party. Oh, yeah, I knew that was about to happen. I slid already. So, um, yeah, it's one of those things. Uh, you can't doubt. You can't doubt yourself if the plan, you made your plan. You know what I'm saying? Like, I created the plan. Why would I doubt it? Why would I be like, oh, well, let me make sure I got everything first or let me save up enough money. Like that sentence will always screw you over. Yes. Yeah, let me save up enough money first. Like it's not coming. It's not coming. The only way it comes to you is if you get out in traffic and it's like, oh, it, it finds you because now you're like locking into the purpose you set for yourself. Like whatever contract you made with yourself, your sales is already getting to work at it. So if you like, you know, I, I want to do this, but I you know want to save some money first. Or I want to move here. I want to save some money first. You know what happens? You save money and then you have a car issue. You yeah. save money and then you need to use that money for shit because that's how life works. It's picking on you. It knows how to pick on you. It's like, we told you not to say that shit. And every time you get to the number, we just going to break you back down. <laughs> Instead of just jumping out and doing exactly what you said you was going to do. And then the next day, you know, you meet someone that's like, oh, I was looking for help just like this. Oh, I float you in advance. Don't worry about it. Like, it can happen that easy, too. So, um, yeah, you, that's something I'm not willing to gamble with. And it usually works out for me. Absolutely. No, it does. I'm a firm believer that you have to jump off the cliff without the parachute in order for you to really figure out how you're going to maneuver. Because oftentimes... People have so many backup plans and it just never really pans out the way that they thought it was going to. So I always say that you just got to figure it out along the way, like to have a vision. Yeah, there's, there's no plan B's, man. Plan B's, yeah. plan B's at CVS. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only plan B I know about. <laughs> and that shit don't even work. <laughs> so I don't know what you want to lean on. Shit <laughs> The shit called plan B don't even work like that. I think it's like 78% perfective. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. How would you say that, that philo this philosophy that you live by now has evolved over the years? I believe it more now than I did years ago. I think my subconscious and my soul will just give me this strong feeling towards uh, we don't have to be disappointed over shit that we refocus our energy on like you know i got there's a uh, what's a great example you know there's things i've thought for myself like i probably would have never gambled that 36 year old me wouldn't have children or <clears throat> be in a you know shared relationship in a home like even 22 year old me, 23 year old me, I, I thought that this age was something that changed. Like I actually feel exactly the same as I did when I was a child. I just am smarter than him. So uh, it's it's more, I believe everything now is, I, I do more of it now than I ever have. Like, because I also subscribe to being present. Like I'm, I'm here right now. So Everything else is me planning forward and just planning forward. And I really tr try, I try, I try my best not to even go through days that I didn't, I'm not living no more unless I needed to use like uh, inspiration from it. So like when I think about food or when I think about my arts, I like time travel in my brain. But outside of that, I just stay right here because it makes, it makes it easier and it slows things down for you. Mm -hmm. Like, I just go at a pace that I know um, fulfills like this kind of hunter gathering stage I'm at where I'm just putting everything in my basket, working on as much stuff that I, I 
not trying to complete everything, but at least putting the stakes in the ground right now. So I don't have to come back and restart. Like I, I, I'll leave stuff for myself that, you know, next year, if somebody was like, yo, Chuck, we want to co- collab with you on some designs towards this. Like I'll have sketches of shit that I was just thinking in my head. And now when it's time for me to work, I don't got to work. Like, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking a whole bunch of songs for commercials and stuff right now. And anytime anybody asks me for anything, I hardly have to make anything new. I got like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sketches and ideas that were pre-planned for this. So like staying present, but planning for the future is just, that's the philosophy on top of, you know, accepting things as they are. That is an important lesson that oftentimes people do not learn And I think it's so important, um, and which is why I brought such a very diverse panel of guests onto these conversations, because every single person that I've had a conversation with thus far um, embraces the concept of change and also adaptation and understanding that we really don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Like literally, we all have is what's right now. And that's how you stay happy, though. That's how you can remain like there's like for example there's pictures of me from like 23 24 on tour that i look older than i do right now in those pictures you know what i'm saying like um i wasn't as present then you know what i'm saying i I wasn't the things i'm saying now i was nowhere near that and then once you are completely completely like free of trying to shift things that your hands can't even grip like you age slower you know what i'm saying um and it's really the key to everything uh it's the key to having relationships with other people it's the key to having a relationship with your craft it's as much as i made cool shit there's days where i've started and and tried to do as much like all right i'm gonna finish this i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do this And then an hour and a half into it, I'm like, bro, it's just not your day. Like, just say that and go do something else. That is one of my bigger teachers. Like, you know, it'd be different if I was playing a sport or something that happened in a short controlled amount of time. But when you're building things that are supposed to last forever, like even if you're a carpenter, there will be a day you try something from scratch and you're like, oh, I'll fuck this up. Mm -hmm. Instead of trying to, force your way through it step back take time off and then hit it tomorrow and you'll be a whole nother person and i think people try to do this race against time like time is as real as it isn't yes like it's only there when you're looking at it it's literally a a quantum a quantum phenomenon because we made it up like yeah the sun goes up and goes down but I don't even know if that's the case because it, it's it's in the same spot. Either we're moving or it's moving. We don't know. So you thinking you only got to age to get something done. It's crazy. Like there are people who think that end up having not as much time, not as much fun uh, living because they worried about getting it done before a certain time. And sometimes like those days where I make shit and I don't like it and I take that break, that break has so much cool shit in it. Like I can be like, oh, I'm gonna go eat. And then because you did that, now you got a whole nother thing that you like. You're like, oh, I've never tried this before. Oh, that makes me think of other things. Oh, that made me improve my mood. It's like, there's so many little Easter eggs in life that if you listen and don't try to force everything, it's very abundant. Yes. I agree. And I have gotten to the place now where I believe it's so important to operate off of inspiration instead of desperation. And when when you recognize that when you operate off of inspiration and you recognize everything around you is abundant, you don't have to necessarily focus on the material aspects of money because oftentimes people chase money instead of purpose and then they end up depleted they end up doing shit that they are not supposed to be doing um, mad 
right? And just mm-hmm. unfilled in so many areas. And so I always say, operate off of inspiration instead of desperation. And when you do that, you create magic. Yeah, I would add one thing to that because uh, I read a book. I, read, I was reading a book when I read the marathon last year. And I got to uh, a section of the book where the guy was talking about a lot of people's it's hard to find or expect people to find inspiration in things if their routine was off before. And routine leads to mechanics where your routine will get you further than inspiration sometimes. Mm-hmm. Like the fact that you do this really well and it's a part of your routine so you don't have to feel like you have to be in the mood to do it. It's, it's, it's tricky though, because, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of what we equate routine to being like skills and trade and not like artistic, Sure. but an artistic routine is way more important than an inspiration. If I didn't have a routine to do certain things and how I do them, I could go like three or four, five, six days without being in the mood and trying to find inspiration and then like trying to find inspiration in the times that we're in right now can be tricky. Like you really got to do a lot. Like, and you don't want to leave it to that. You want to let inspiration be like, you know, given the gas, but you getting in the car and the car moving has to be routine. Like how fast you go should be inspiration. That way you don't ever get stuck. So let the routine get you there. And if you're feeling inspired today, you're going to have a couple of home runs. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean you're not going to hit the ball. So I'll explain that in baseball teams. Like routine is the hit. Inspiration is like I'm hitting home runs today. But you don't want your routine to have you not even hit making contact with the ball. You know what I'm saying? Like you have, if your job is to hit the ball, you need to make that routine and not inspiration because you'll step up to the plate and that bitch will just because you're not in the mood. Like you can't let mood dictate anything. And I think we're at a state in our world where we we were taught about mood, like feel inspired, be emotional. Everything is just the extremes of the extremes. Like no matter which direction you're looking in, whether it's a billboard, whether it's a bus passing, where it's a commercial, it's like, let's tap into the most um, uh, detail part of that person's emotions like when they play these sir kind of slow piano little things and there's moms and kids in the kitchen sharing cereal like it's never that fucking deep man like it's not that deep of, it's not that deep but advertisers know like we're moody we're moody maybe you weren't thinking about feeding your child well look how sad and happy you'll feel if you do you know what I mean? Like those extremes is why staying uh, in routine and not uh, waiting to be inspired is important because you could have, you could be inspired to do something, stub your toe and and be like, fuck this. I don't like this. I'm going back in the house. Like you go outside, step into some dog shit. Now you don't even want to get in the car. <laughs> See, like that's, in, that's where, that's where like, Routine is I'm gonna wipe this dog shit off my feet because I got somewhere to go. And that's all I would say to add to that is that's what I practice. Like I was not inspired to run a marathon. I just wanted to see me do some shit that I, you know, I don't have to do. No one has to do a marathon. It's just, I'm not scared of shit and I'll do it. But the thing I did that was, I wouldn't suggest is I didn't train hard for it. Like, I didn't want to know at 22 miles while training that this shit sucked. I'd rather be in the middle of the marathon at 22 miles and be like, I still got to finish and I'm done. Mm -hmm. So um, routine got me there. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to do this. I always complete shit I do. Even if it's a marathon, I'm going to complete it. Do I train well for shit? I haven't played sports since high school. I don't know. I don't want to leave. I don't want to leave it up to me to be like, hey, man, do you feel like running 17 miles this Saturday morning? Because 10 times out of 10, we'll be like, hell no. Nah. But do I like a challenge and will I be prepared for it? Yeah, because when I got to mile 22, 
the one thing I said to myself was, "You smart, bro. You definitely, <laughs> definitely would have been. Th- <laughs> we definitely been would have been thought we thought this whole fucking thing, man. Because mile twenty four to mile twenty six was just like, fuck this. But couldn't wait to do it again afterwards. But like now I know, and I know the reward. But I wasn't gonna let inspiration run that marathon for me. I was going to create routine and process. Like the process was tight. Yes, yes. And I'm right. I actually ran five marathons and uh, it was more than just the routine and the regimen that you t- adopt every single day. It's a discipline. Yeah. And I believe that it's a discipline for everything that you do in life, consistency. Because I, I mean, five years in a row, I ran full marathons and it was in the training that I got great at marathon even running the marathon it was like I had to discipline my mind to recognize that it's mind over matter I I could have totally my body wanted to give up so many times and I'm like no like you had the discipline to do the regimen every single day to train yourself you got this like you got this and and so I, I'm right there with you that that yes, it is a routine. It's a discipline every single day. Well, yeah, day. the routine that's that's it's, it's it's synonymous with discipline. When I say yeah. routine, I mean yeah, like the discipline is the routine. That's what discipline is. This is this is this is the only thing I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And like everything outside of it either feeds into what I'm doing or is a distraction. It's discipline. And then once you put that in front of each other and you start doing it every day, that's the routine. Absolutely. Like, so um, in anything, it's like uh, you think about the best basketball players in the world. You think about anybody that's super, uh, superiorly, superior in their talent. It's routine, man. Like golf, golf is like one of those sports too. Everybody that's good at golf their level, their muscle memory, their, their discipline, their, like that type of discipline to have that, um, like to be able to gauge distance, curvature in the ground, all of that shit isn't just pure talent. That routine is so disciplined that his body doesn't know, your body don't know what else to do, but what you exactly you want it. It's like a, it's like Steph Curry shooting three pointers. His, his body is so routine like routinely programmed that this is the muscles you use yeah. for the ball to go in uh-huh. if you know if he's done that let's just say he shoots a hundred thousand three pointers a month the only way you can shoot like him is if you shoot do that like there's no other real recipe to how you become great at shit other than it's pure routine and your body doesn't know how to do anything else right so like, even with me and, mu- and music, like I go in and out on the days I create, but I don't ever have a day where I haven't searched for a sound that's better than mine and like literally repeat it so many times that I'm like, I know what they did there. I'm, a, I'm not gonna, like, I know what they did there. And then that always is inside my head when I think about tones when I hear people's voices that I'm like, oh, this reminds me of this. Like, let's try it this way. Like, as much as I want to give way to that's my talent, it's, I, I, I listen to at least 30 to 40 new songs in full that I've never heard each day. Nice. From eras, eras, like new stuff a lot of time, but like I'll find bands that are like, that can do shit I can't do. And I will listen to that so much so that when I want to build a song that it's not the sound that I couldn't do but it was like a transition or a time switch or something that was placed there I've never heard before like I don't do yo shut up Siri I need to turn this off quit listening to me like that (laughs) like shut up um yeah it's it's discipline and, and routine man there's just no other way around that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's like the secret to everything. Even when I'm cooking, um, you know, I, I this is why I love cooking so much is 
it's impossible to be the absolute best. Someone will always make something way better. That looks prettier. That has a crazier, uh, like two day fermentation. Pro- some shit that you are like, fuck. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like the the way I like get comfortable with certain things is, you know, like if I want to make a dish and I want to be good at it, I'll make it three times by myself before I even let people know I did it. Like. I was making Spanish paella. I did that three days in a row. Like, still, still couldn't figure out. Like, I was everyone was good. I would, I would uh, like let people try it. But like to me, I was like, oh, I get why. I get why like certain family recipes or certain things or certain ways because they've made it like two hundred thousand times. Yes. And when there's a lot of something and you can't, you can't put cheese in it, so you're not adding to the recipe. You're perfecting the recipe, mm-hmm. which like it's like i said routine and discipline it's in every single thing that's in anything we uh experience uh sensually so yes Yes. and that's that's a skill that we develop every single when we do it every single day through that discipline and that regimen that routine that's the only way that you're going to be able to master yourself and you're going to be able to master your craft Right. Now, I think it's so important, um, and, and I know more than ever now that my circle of influence is, like, key. So how would you say that your upbringing and circle of influence has impacted the way that you think and live today? I mean, it's everything. I'm, I'm just, uh, I am a reprint of my experiences. <clears throat> so, you know, the, the way I speak, uh, all of that is from, you know, picking up, picking up my dad and uh, how he was, uh, how my uncles were, um, the music that they listened to, um, what they reacted to. And then I would take that on my own journey. And, you know, I found things I liked on my own, but how I apply it comes from, you know, like, being born on the east side of Detroit when I was, seeing the things I saw, finding the cool and everything, even if it was kind of fucked up and scary. Mm -hmm. And um, knowing that in the experiences I've had that changed me or made me who I am, I've always wanted to share that with people. Like the feeling I get when there's a song I can't stop listening to or there was a car I saw, like, you know, being younger and seeing, uh, coming out of school, because this, this is a defining moment for me. Coming out of school, I'm like in third or fourth grade, and uh, the big baseball player at the time, Cecil Fielder, his son went across, He went, who was a big, uh, I am sick of you, bro, shut up. I got to figure out how to turn this off. Oh, I clicked it. All right. Not bad. But um, Prince Fielder, who was a big baseball player, too, when he was younger, his dad, he went to school across the street from me. Um, and his dad was the biggest baseball player on the Tigers, one of the uh, all-star, all of the. Uh, we're getting out of school, and his dad comes to pick him up in a, a powder blue 1963 uh, Chevy Impala, like with gold Dayton's, all that shit. And like, he had hydraulics on it, and like he had parked it out front of the school and like dropped it all the way down to the ground. And from that day, I was like, "Yeah, that's what I'm about to do. Whatever that made me feel like, I want that. I want. I want that. Like, in every single department, I want that. Like down to being on my front porch when I first had my bike, and seeing like the Mustang with the. Sh- oh my. I don't, I just want you to turn off. Give me one second. I don't know why this is, it's ruining my experience. (laughs) Can I say, hey Siri, turn off. Thank you. Smart ass robot. All right, um, down to uh, seeing like um, a Mustang with 
uh, like exposed fat wheels on it and like deep dishes and them playing like the craziest whatever they were playing, the, the uh, convertible top half up to one to be like everything that came out that trunk musically, I, I want to make that. Whatever I felt that song was when this car passed, I want to make that. Seeing, uh, being at roller skate, like when I was younger and seeing like uh, a guy have uh, like an outfit that was custom made. Like he had like a leather sweatsuit and it, it being in the craziest colors and then matching his skates. And I was like, all right, I, I need that too. Like all of these little um, influential moments is, that I had when I was a child, I always tried to blend them into one full experience. And, you know, I found the east side of Detroit beautiful. I found, I found everything about, you know, especially my black experience in Detroit, having parents that are really versed in the history, knowing more about myself than, or having the uh, blessings of knowing more about myself as a young black kid than some of my peers got to experience. And that's why like, when I put the cool kids out, that was me telling all the other kids that this is what I was feeling the whole time. Like, I know that we had a disadvantage and shit is fucked up, but we the coolest people in the world. And we've proven that. So I lean into that a little bit more. And like, that's the brand, we cool as hell. Like, we gotta stand on that. Like, um, it, it kind of bothers me the narratives that you know, even from the summer to now to how the corporate uh, energy is with trying to like pander or uh, understand what like the black oppression stuff is. It's like, we know that shit, right? It's the cool shit that we do that's ours that y'all try to package and sell without putting anybody else on it is where everybody's upset at. Like, you ain't gonna do it like us. And that's cool. But don't suppress the little shit that we got going. I saw that obstacle super early. And I was like, nah, I'm gonna dance over here. I'm gonna do this, this, I'm gonna do this a little different over here. Because this, even though it's near and dear in my heart, and I know it's like the blackest shit I, I could think of, this is worldwide. Like, I'm not saying it's that, it is that, but what you're doing is what you wanna do because it's cool, right? If I put a different package on it though, and I'm like, these are what the black kids are doing, you might offend a couple people. If you were like, everybody's doing this, that's what we want. You know what I'm saying? It's not about um, putting it in category. And that was why I could use my experiences and see, you know, going through my parents' old photo books and seeing how fresh everybody was dressed. Like I only wore shit and my fashion uh, inspiration is from my family. Like watching how you know, my grandfather dressed when it's barbecue time or we'd have people over. Everybody was just sharp. And I was like, I'm gonna use that. And you go to other people's house, other black people like me, and you look through theirs and it's like, oh, we was all cool as hell for a minute. Like, let's use this. We not, you know, we, we, we are in abundance because the things that we have experienced is a, is a, is, hold on. It's crazy because there's a lot of similarities in all of us. And even when you get into other cultures and other different households or whether it be Caribbean, whether it be uh, Hispanic, and you start to realize like everybody does their own cool shit. Yes. And being able to use that is the art form. Trying to use it to compare is the kryptonite, yes. you know what I'm saying? Yes. So, um, but yeah, my, my experiences, I am them. 
I'm, that's, I reflect what I see. That's why I always put myself in situations where I get a lot of back uh, optically and audibly. Like I don't have to necessarily feel, but to take care of my eyes and my ears. And now like my taste buds, I, I can, I could shape things to, like I said, I could shape shift things to make them come at you harder than they came at me. So I can give you the influence I got. Cause if that's one gift I could share, it's like, if I keep on touching all this shit and now you feel like me, it's going to get dangerous. Cause if it's a whole bunch of me's, can't shit go wrong. And it's so it's so important to be um, to not only be influenced by your circle of influence, and I think it's really important for, especially someone like yourself, who you're very prominent in your industries, and now you're kind of you're you're getting you're becoming a part of a lot of different types of things, and I think it's so important for us to do that because as human beings, we are multidimensional. In our society, we're taught to be one track mind to do it one way and to do one thing and to, but, you know, people like you who are really creating waves on this planet and teaching people that we are multidimensional and we have the ability to do, you know, multiple things and be successful at it. It's really mm -hmm. important for us to choose, to choose to surround ourselves with people that are positively influencing what we, what we deem, you know, to be true. And also right. so that we can influence people in that way as well. Cause we, we are like, we're always, um, we're always impacting people in the vicinity of our energetic field. That's our, that's our world right there. Right. Do you believe that your line of work and artistry infects our society with positivity? Or well, I wouldn't do it. I mean, that's a, that's simple for me. Like I get to enjoy it, but I um I like things to be beautiful. Like I like them to work. And if anything I could ripple is that like as much love and, and understanding as I have for uh the imperfect shit, I think that's the one thing I want everybody to know. It's like there is no perfection. It only is perfect it it's already perfect but it's just how you look at it and nothing but perfection is such a crazy concept but things being beautiful is obtainable you know what i mean like beauty beauty is in the energy of things and like i i um that's exactly what i do with things for it's like everybody has to figure out what they're supposed to do here and if I could do shit that is cool to me, but cooler to you, then I win. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm doing a whole bunch of cool shit, which adds up into like the most cool shit. And then if you get one thing off of it and you think it's cooler than I even thought it was cool, then we're all winning. Like I, I can't lose and you, you came up. If I can't lose and you come up, that's great. Like, because I'll always win from that. Like if I, if I lift up the people around me so much higher than me, like when everybody is looking at, like, why is everything going right? Oh, it's Chuck. Like <laughs> I'll, I'll literally will sit in the car while a whole stadium of kids that I influenced do some shit. Like I, I, I like the idea that, you know what I mean? Like I like the idea that I put this many people together and like they don't got shit to do with me. Like that's my wealth. It don't got shit to do with me, but it started with me. Mm -hmm. I could live with that. Yes. I remember the last conversation that we had. It was the day that I called you when I saw that picture of you in Doja Cat. And you mm -hmm. told me you had gone back to Michigan to work on one of your albums. And that your dad asked you about your work and what you wanted to re be remembered for. How did that conversation with your father really shift the trajectory because I know that things kind of shifted for you at that point. No, I, I did that. I think I did that before. I went to go play golf with my dad for my birthday. And then I think Doja's birthday is like later in the month, like October 19th through 21st. One of, I, I don't remember, but um, I think that 
like I say, going back to my first point, my ability to adjust and my parents have always been like, use all your talents. And knowing that this one thing that I can do for other people brings me so much peace and serenity, especially from the angle I come at it with, which is just barbecue. Um, I, I kind of needed that a little bit just because in the art that I make, there's no instant gratification to it. Like I get to listen to it. I get to play it for a couple people, but I don't get to feel like the reaction I do if I cook for a whole bunch of people. Mm -hmm. And when you're in the service business, like me, you need, you need, you need that energy to come back on you. So you can have that fulfillment to continue. Yeah. It's quicker in the food lane. And since I can't really DJ for people anymore, like I used to, I, I would go and start a DJ set and know I was going to fuck about 13 people up with a couple of these song selections. Just looking at the room, I'm like, I know you ain't heard this in a minute. I know you ain't heard this in a minute. I know you're going to go crazy over this. That was very satisfying. Now, the world's kind of changed. You don't get that. I've been doing some, you know, like digital streaming DJ sets. And it just, I did one and I was like, yeah, I'm never doing this shit again. Um, yeah, it's just pointless. So back to my first point, being able to adjust and knowing that there is an abundance, there's, there's an abundance of things I can pull off that bring people enjoyment. So instead of complaining about the world being this one way, and using my food to connect dots. So it's like, I have meetings where you could go to a restaurant or I'll barbecue. Like there's a lot of people I met in music just by barbecuing. And knowing that, um, knowing that food is the ultimate communicator. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I, I love to connect to people. So <clears throat> I used an opportunity that was got given that I was not, I would, I did not give, get enough time to prepare for. I used two different lessons, like just get to it. And if you're doing something you're supposed to be doing, it'll all work out. So, yeah. Have you always had a love for cooking? Cause I, I mean, I know that you've always loved food and, and food is obviously a part of our culture and it's very prominent in, in what we do every single day. But when did you realize that that was something that you were really gifted at? Um, I realized that when every, uh, every like kind of eventful thing that happens like in American year, like the a year in, in America, like whether it be Memorial Day, Labor Day, 4th of July, I realized that the people around me trusted me with everything and weren't even going to go to nobody else's house to eat. Um, but when my uncle passed away in 2013, who kind of showed me how to barbecue and told me that he basically laid the groundwork for the example of how tight your family is when you eat together, how tight your friend base is when you eat together. And there's like, there's a, a peace, a peaceful transference of energy when you're standing around the grill with your other family or is having a beer or no one's rushing, but they know that at the end of this process, they're watching you do, they're going to be extremely satisfied and fulfilled. Like that's when I just leaned into it a little bit more because right now I'm still, I'm not even, even close. I'm just, I just come up with cool shit to make and I know how not to fuck it up. I, I'm, I could be like, 40 times better by next year if I just stick to this. And I do, like, I, I, there's not a day I don't watch a recipe I don't know how to make. And then I don't always try it, but I'll, I'll watch it and rewatch it and rewatch the process. So by the time I do it, I'm really aware, I'm, I'm very aware of how it's supposed to work. And I'm good with shit like that. If I know how it's supposed to work, I'll get it together. Absolutely. I think that that's a part of being just a creative and a creator, knowing that if you can create music, which is a skill that 
I mean, a, a lot of people, like, in the grand scheme of things, you think that a lot of people have, but in reality, like to be good mm -hmm. at, at producing, creating, mixing tracks, like, you know, even DJing, DJing is not an easy, especially if you, because there's so many, there's so many different genres of music. There's so many different types of beats. There's culturals. Right when it comes to music so if you know how to do that I feel like you have the ability to really create anything that you put your mind to and that's a lot of times people they're so scared to even try they're so mm -hmm. scared to try different things but yeah when you have the ability to create one thing you can you can create a grand scheme of things that it's it's, it's a yeah. skill to have yeah how do people react to your food? And do you play your music? Do you do your DJ sets too when you're like catering? No, nah, no. Nah. Uh, the food reaction is, it's it's because I know what people, I love to eat and I know it tastes really good. And this is a very crowded space and presentation can distort uh, quality. Sometimes people make shit look real cool, but it doesn't taste like that. Mm -hmm. I know what's the most important part is, does it taste good? Fuck everything else. Does it taste good? And it's the same thing I use in food, art, music. It's, is this shit slapping? If not, then what are we talking about? Like, I don't want to be involved unless it's rocking. Like, why not? Like, I don't want to play records at a party I want to listen to. I want to play what you want to hear. And I know what you want to hear because that's what I do. I don't want to feed you shit that I want to feed you. I want to feed you shit I know that you're going to dip that in that and you're going to take a bite of that and you're going to look at me like, how the fuck you do that? <laughs> I didn't. I just tricked you into I tricked you into a plate of something you actually really wanted. Yeah. Instead of being like, oh, no, this is this is what people are eating. This is what you're being fed. No, I actually gave you exactly what you wanted. And you ain't even know that shit. So that's that's the driving force. And they all go hand in hand. That's why like music and food to me are very similar because I'm doing the same shit. I'm giving you some shit you ain't even know you want it like that. And now you don't even know how you go. How, you don't even know how you didn't live your life like this before. So that's kind of like the, that's kind of how I, I whip the pot up. I just, I know people and I'm, I'm being an artist in that uh, sense. Like I know people so well that I know you, I know what you're going to like before you like it. So I'm going to just put it right in front of your face instead of trying to get you to like something I know you won't like with, with a marketing scheme. Like I don't have to do that shit. I just know what you're going to like. And I've done that with, you know how many people that are, you know, oh man, I haven't eaten this in so long, or I don't eat meat, or I don't do this, and I'll take this shit off the grill, and I won't, I won't say, hey, try it, and the people will be like, oh, I'm gonna break this today. I just, I just need to know what that tastes like. It wasn't that you just ate meat; you ate what I made for you. And you knew that this was an experience. It's not just me cooking this shit and putting it out. Like, I cooked it for me, so I wouldn't feed myself no bullshit. So. Absolutely. And I believe, well, my next question, and, and you've pretty much answered this already, but how do you stay relevant, unique, and true to who you are as a person in a world that is filled with just cookie cutter everything? Because I actually did this shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, I did the hard shit. So um, I don't got to fake nothing. I don't got to step over nobody. I, I know what it's like when you work your ass off to get something, but you worked smart, not too hard. Like I haven't experienced too much failures that would have hardened me to not like want other people to win. And as much as I'm not that type of motherfucker, I can understand how people are shitty when they're trying to do something and it ain't working out for them. And they are not as happy for you when shit is working out for you. That's what creates these character flaws in people where it's like it's like all dogs are sweet till you kick them you know what I mean like all you got to do is kick me once and I'm just not coming back over here and if you kick me again I'm gonna bite your fucking leg off so I don't even have no um there's no middle ground 
for there to be the third kick, which would have hardened me. I'm like, oh, y'all kicking dogs over there. Fuck it. I'm not going back over there unless I'm ready to get put down because I'm biting the shit out of one of you motherfuckers. <laughs> like it's it's that type of edge uh, that you gotta have with your passion. Yeah. So um, I do believe that all people are good in their hearts. I feel like the situations that they put in, they wasn't either built for, or they had some sort of pride or some form of self that they just needed to see. And that's where shit be going wrong at. Yes. Now, you know, the people that are snaky and I think like, like I said, I feel like I can't have the ability to see the best in people only cause you know not to try it with me and I'm not gonna give you a second chance. You know what I'm saying? Like, especially with people I know that don't have the same type of soul as me. I'm still nice to you, but there should be an instilled fear that you don't kick me twice. You know what I'm saying? Like, as soon as your foot comes up off the ground on the second time, you might die. And not saying that, like, not like dangerous, but you have to you have to protect your energy and you got to protect it in a way that's not just um, the holistic way. You have to have the yin and yang. Like, no matter how good you are, don't let one person think that that second kick is going to land. Like, you obviously don't know that shit, I'm gonna either show you this lesson today before a, a truck hits you and kills you. Like, I might be the one that incepts in your mind that you taking this out on the wrong person. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? A lot of people don't know how to direct their anger. Like, it's a it's a, uh, it's a saying out in LA. A lot of homies I know, it was the illest shit in the world. It's like, get down where you mad at, because mm-hmm. If you let it go, it's that's weak. Um, and not let it go. If you are entertaining it past the moment that you were pissed, then it's fake. You held on to that shit to try to use it later. That's not real. Get down where you mad at. You know what I'm saying? Get it off your chest. Maybe I'll understand it more. But don't bring that shit up to me tomorrow. Like, you felt it yesterday. Why are you talking about it right now? It's over with. And a lot of people carry shit months, years, fucking decades into shit that ain't even the issue. Absolutely. Like, say what you're supposed to say. Get down on who did what they did right there. Because you ain't gonna get no respect trying to double back. Well, somebody did this to me two years ago. So? So? The fuck that gotta do with anybody? Two years is a long ass time. You could have had your shit together by then. Mm-hmm. So, um, having that edge, though, protects the who I am because I don't have to worry about somebody getting me out of my character ever. Like, you you can't, there's no, there's nothing anyone could say to me that would make me more upset. I, I'm gonna get down where I'm mad at. You say something to me in a way that I don't like, you gonna feel it right there though. And then we're gonna be either able to talk through it or it's not gonna be able to be talked, nothing to talk about. You know what I'm saying? But I'll give people that freedom, but I'm not letting you have that responsibility with me. Yeah. Like, ain't nobody else going to be more responsible for my emotions than me. Absolutely. So that's how I stay the same person since you met me. Like, <laughs> as, as nice as I am, you know, ain't nobody ever talked to me too crazy. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not up for debate. And I'm not a, a tough guy, but... I know you not either. So that's the difference. I'm not a tough guy, but I looking in your soul and I know you're not that tough either. Like you just hurt and you could get over that. Absolutely. And that's why it's really important that that every single individual that we self-assess, self-correct so that we can self-master. And that's a daily ritual. That is a daily thing because we have to understand as human beings that anything that is ever given to us by another person, like if somebody's being reactive, angry, that really has nothing to do with you as a person who's receiving it from the other person. It has everything to do with the person who's reacting the way that they're right. reacting. And it's important. It's important for always for us to always remember that 
everybody's reactions is responsibility of their own. And we, it is, it's important for us to be able to have conversations with people if people are willing to listen. Um, because if not, I, I tend to just walk away and just, you know, observe the situation, assess myself and how I'm responding or reacting towards the situation. Mm -hmm. And then taking it personal because that that oftentimes can lead us down this rabbit hole that just puts us in misery not yeah you can't it. do that you can't do that it's not yeah working. and it's like taking things personal is it's it's just like it's incurring a lot of debt like it's like own it's like own our irs a whole bunch of money it's the same type of it's the same type of pool absolutely like, just get over it. like i said get down where you mad at and get over it yes like, like like be honest with your emotions don't hide shit don't but when you get down where you mad at you less reactionary because you know how to apply yourself you know how you know how to be like all the all the the negative things you go through like um, uh being annoyed being pissed someone saying something to you like when you don't take it personally like, you know how many times I've been in a grocery store and heard some somebody say something or try to pass, and I just look at them like, I just give them the, a child. I look at them like, like a child. Like, I don't, I don't respond back. I was like, hey, you know, just one word. Just like, I'm not the one. Like, relax. That comes from, I didn't take that personal, but I don't want nothing else following you outside this store that might do you more dirty than you deserve just because you don't know how to control because once you're on that opposite side of rage and all that shit you susceptible for, to whatever else is on that side of the fence so if you chill out like your day will go well <laughs> but like you ain't mad at me so shut the fuck up <laughs> like that's always my thing like you wasn't talking to me but you should still shut up like <laughs> it will just really help you out <laughs> like I've I've told people to shut the fuck up in the most nicest ways. I don't think anybody can art, master that art form of just being like, I didn't tell you this, but the message is just shut the fuck up. Like you'll get through it. <laughs> like it didn't come from me, but I know you heard that, so just turn it up in your ear <laughs> and listen to the enunciation of the word. <laughs> I just don't think anybody could ever stay mad at you. I just, <laughs> you have just like, delivering things that it's like, I just want to laugh. I just, I can't even That's what mad. I got. That's all I got. <laughs> I can't even be mad. Oh my God. Do you, do you believe that the work that you do every day is aligned with, with your calling and your higher purpose? And what does that even mean to you? Um, I don't, I don't, this is the highest purpose until I, I hear something else or I see something else, but I'm always just going to, I'm always going to be as of service to this planet in whatever way I can. And like the arts and entertainment is what I was placed and my ability to have as much influence as I had has showed me that well, this is where I'm supposed to be. Like I can communicate things through other mediums. So I'm a great communicator. That's the highest purpose. But like I said, I'm still an infant in this shit. Like I, I don't know anything. So if I wake up tomorrow and somebody hands me this pamphlet and it's like, we need you to do this. And I knew that, uh, damn, I'm, I guess I am the only one for the job. Then that's now that's my purpose. It's, so whatever you can do that day. And I practiced and done enough that done enough of the groundwork that it's really like a finger point for me. You know what I mean? Like, oh yo, Chuck, we wanna do this? Boom, it's done. Boom, it's done. Boom, it's done. That's when you know you're in your your calling. But like I said, to answer that question would mean that I know what I'm talking about and I don't know shit. Like, I don't know. I just know that this is where I was led and I'm gonna do my best here until I end up somewhere else. Was there ever a point in your journey? Because I know that this has been a very long journey for you. 
was there ever a point where you said, this is maybe not what I should be doing? Uh, yeah, you go through a lot of those, but younger, my younger days. Um, but if you get one of those and you don't have a better answer or a, like another option in your head, then it's just you tripping. It's just yeah. you being an asshole to yourself. And I, I, I do a good job of not doing that. So, yeah, it's not about uh, whether I feel like I was supposed to because I knew what I was doing the first day I got to college. Like, I've known exactly what I wanted to do since I was 17 years old. And being in it, it's like everybody I know that's do, that that's like me has got the same story. Like, we knew. And you could be working. I've been working every single day towards this. I'm 36 now. Like it's a lot of my friends and peers where it's like that shit didn't even hit them or the the abundance that they needed or the the wealth that they were working hard to acquire to even build even build up more. Um like doesn't even hit till you're like 42. You know what I mean? Like it's this is a it's a 20-year journey usually. And um hold on. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. It's, uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's the one thing that is constant is the road is long, but it's giving and it's warm and you meet a lot of cool people on it. But the tricky part is a lot of people jump off right about now. Yes. Like, oh, this shit still sucks a little bit. Like, I want all the money. And then, you know, you might meet someone and then they can make things easier for you. So you're like, oh, well, let me get married and have a kid. And now your trajectory switched. And you're like, you, it didn't happen. That didn't come into your world. You went and got it because you wanted to feel something that was better than this. But it don't get better than this until it does. And that's the whole, that's the whole thing It's like, you got to be patient. And honestly, because I'm 36 as well, and I feel like I'm 36 going on 75 <laughs> with the <laughs> amount of experience that we've had. Although I feel in my physical body that I'm at 25, because like you said earlier, I feel younger now at 36 than I did in my early 20s because I was always trying to achieve something or even right. gain riches that I learned through my journey that wealth really has nothing to do with the physicality of money. I believe that what we do for a living really is just, um, money is just a byproduct of what we do and how we're circulating. And um, and I've, I've just had to really reframe my, my mindset when it came to that. But I realized that experience, the experience that we've gained at this age, that's oh, so yeah. abundant. I mean, it's, there's I feel no like other way. there's a there's lot no of- There's no other way around it. There's no other way around it. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. How do you, how do you, um, or what practices, because you did talk about like routine and regimen, um, but how do you keep yourself grounded and divinely connected to yourself and your creator every single day? Um, I would say it's, it's kind of like that, what I was telling you about being present, yeah. being grateful, recognizing patterns, um, listening to the internal voice, which is the creator. Yes. Uh, I guess that, there, that's the only thing because it's not it's it's easy to lose track of that sometimes because we are experiencing this uh life in this body and there aren't too many visual um examples of this is real uh you know like you haven't seen your creator and you haven't met them even though you you most likely have already before you got here. Um, you just got to know that this isn't, like I said, I, it's a really good question, but it's really hard to answer only because of how different people see 
what what that is like the, the, the whole idea i can look at the i can look at the trees waving at the same time mm -hmm. and or how you know poetic ocean waves are or like how sufficient and in abundance like birds live and all of this shit and just being happy that i could isolate that and know that this is what i'm looking for and this proves to me that uh the creator's all around i think being able to see like like i said see through shit and not take everything at face value gives a lot of uh a lot of i have a lot of thanks uh, i'm very appreciative i think my one of my only prayers that is a recurring prayer is thank you thank you thank you even when i don't got shit i want right then like it's always thank you thank you thank you because i know you know what i mean like i have to be patient i ask for a lot and i always get it it's just i don't necessarily get it at the time i want it but that's on me so you always have to give thanks and ask for the things that you need and to always place you where um, you can thrive. And I haven't been letting down in that department. So I have to give thanks. Amen. That's so true. I mean, gratitude, I feel like is the biggest magnet for miracles and understanding that everything that we need is what we have right now. And you know what actually brought up this whole conversation as a whole to begin with was this summer I was laying in a hammock underneath the trees in my front yard and my father he was he was um watering the plants and he came right by me and this question came to mind because I love to read books about spirituality but I also love to read autobiographies about people just like you and I that have had the opportunity to fulfill a lot of great things in their life. And really? my father has been a very prominent figure in my life. I really respect him. I value his opinions and his philosophies and just what he lives by every single day. And I remember asking him the question about what is your life's philosophy? And he's 73 years old. So he's been around the sun quite a bit of times and he has a lot of experience. And his response was, I want to know myself well enough to know who God truly is. And he spends a lot of time in nature. He waters the plants. He interacts with people all the time. He really admires like flowers. He'll come in and he'll just be like, did you see the flower? Like, do you ever think about how this was created? Like how God took color and just like created something out of nothing. And he thinks of and contemplates on that every single day. And it's so important because that really allows us when we when we recognize the the natural the the nature around us like we recognize that God is in everything and it doesn't matter what that looks like to you it doesn't matter what you believe God to be but it really is evident that that presence is everywhere it's in mm -hmm. everything and we are a reflection of that right no exactly um what was I gonna say? I wanted to. I want to make sure I answer all the rest of yours because we we uh, it's almost <laughs> we've been. Oh, yeah. We, yeah. Yeah. So, I so just we, looked at the time. I was just like, oh, we've been talking. Oh my goodness. Okay. Yes. yes. One more question. So, <laughs> what right. word of wisdom would you give to those seeking a deeper understanding of themselves? Words of wisdom. Um. It's not going to be the same for everybody, but um, mine was, I had uh, a really ill, great relationship with psychedelics. Like, uh, I think through the pandemic, right before then, like, it was a couple of things that I got to see that mirrored things that I wasn't actually seeing correctly. Now, I'm not saying psychedelics is for everybody, but that film being taken off my, you know, that part of your eyes that tell your brain what's happening, that's reality. Reality is what your brain compresses shit down to make sense to you. Reality is probably one sixth of the shit that's happening on earth. Um, 
be able and willing to question or shake up that reality so you can actually see what's going on and making your own decisions from there is the wisdom. Like, don't ever take anybody else's word for it because I don't even know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying? So the wisdom is, all right, I mean, I know how to make that a sentence. You don't know shit and that's cool. <laughs> it's just, uh, you can read whatever you want. <laughs> you still don't know shit. And when you, when you are accepting of that, and you become closer to the God particle because you're going to tell him you know shit or her. You're going to tell God what you know. So, so he could be like, yeah, yeah, cool. You don't know shit. <laughs> and there's <laughs> and that, uh, that's brought me more peace, especially in my later years, not later years, in my recent years, uh, you know, becoming more adult at this time, like doing my 30, learning that my 30s was gonna be the 20s that I thought I was gonna have is the you don't know shit. Bro. Like <laughs> our 40s is gonna be so much different than what our parents' 40s were because they were in a time continuum that told them that, you know, 50 is old, you know, fucking Jay-Z's 50. It's a whole different brand of 50 now. Yeah. like. People 50 don't even have gray hair anymore. Like we're aging way slower. And I bet you didn't know that. <laughs> like, I bet you didn't know that we get to the 2021s and all the 40 year old people look like 24 year olds from the nineties. You get what I'm saying? Like there's peace, there's peace in it. I know they said ignorance is bliss, but it's not ignorance. We're using the wrong word, accepting that you don't know shit is bliss and that you can learn something every day is bliss. Yeah. Like, um, yeah, I don't, I never thought, I never thought that people saying ignorance is, is the, is the correct word for that, but there is a blissful state in accepting shit just as it is. All right. This is what it is today. Okay. All right. And then you put one foot in front of that other foot and you start stacking up all these experiences where you're like, oh, I like that. I like how that is. Like it could be just a, a big ass piece of, I forgot what I saw. It was like a Christmas tree. I, somebody must've put their Christmas tree out late as hell uh, on my block. But it was a Christmas tree out like on the street while I was taking the garbage out. And the, where it was placed was so fucking funny. It was like, Half off, it looked like the Christmas tree crawled and it just gave up. Like it's hedged over on, on one part of the curb, the stick is coming out. And I was looking at that shit and I was like, that's tight. Like I was just, I, I was, I don't know why I thought it was tight. I was just like, this motherfucking Christmas tree is chilling. Like it looked like it's got its feet up. And you know, those little small anecdotes I, I, I come up with during my day is because I'm actually got my eyes and looking around and being like, most people would have been like, why the fuck is there a Christmas tree right here? I'm like, there's a Christmas tree right here. That's tight. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and I can see art and things like that. I'm like, all right, I like where that's placed. I had nothing to do with it. I can change it if I want. I could have put the Christmas, I, if I didn't like the way the Christmas tree looked, I could put it in the dumpster. But now what that, what, what, had, what would that have done to my day? You get what I'm saying? Like that shit was just where it needed to be. Like why now I got to go out of my way to change something that had nothing to do with nothing. Yeah. So like, that's the wisdom. The wisdom is you didn't come up with it. So let it go. Just relax. Yes. And, and don't relax. Like be lazy. Be relax with your emotions. Like be like, all right, I'm just going to be cool with shit until I see something that excites me. And then I'll be excited that way when things aren't going your way, you can see through it, but you're not too overly pressed. You're just like, whatever, man. There's a Christmas tree outside somewhere I could go look at. I'll be cool. Like, and then you get back to it. So that's kind of like my wisdom. It's long-winded, but you know, if you ask me this question again next year, I'm gonna have a different answer. And that's the that's the goal is to always have a different answer to that question because you learn. That's what it is. It's 
except it is. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, Evan, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be here with me. You're welcome. You have added so much value and uh, to the person who has taken the time to join this conversation, whether it's today, tomorrow, next year, 10 years from now, that you take some little nuggets of wisdom and that you are able to maybe adopt them in the life that you are creating today and every day. May you continue to be blessed and abundant in everything that you do, and we will see you soon. Peace. Thank you. Love you. Peace. Yes.